Yeah, but then we're realizing she had an alibi because she was in Sweden at the time of her murder. So there's not really any way she could, she could do that. Um, the other theory was his friend Finnis Brown helped him with it, but again, that was possible. Um, and then Robert Manley was another one. Um, he was a married man, had been dating Elizabeth, and he was the last person to get the person seen of her, but um, was ruled out after he passed polygraph. And then Bugsy Siegel was um, a suspect, but there was actually no evidence other than this guy Don Wolf wrote a book called The Black Dolly Files where he claimed Bugsy Siegel was the murderer and there was like no other um, piece of evidence. And then the last one is George Holdle, which is he's kind of widely to be widely thought to actually be the killer based on everything. Um, he had a lot of medical experience as a surgeon and he had a very long past of violence, sexual assault and potential murder. Um, so basically what, insti what instigated um, the investigation into him was his son found a picture of what he thinks is Elizabeth Short and a letter with similar handwriting um, to the one sent to the examiner. He was friends with a man called named Man Ray who painted bodies like cut in half. Um, so that was another reason. And he had bought, he had recently bought a house called the Soden House, which had evidence of uh, human remains in the soil in the backyard. And there was um, blood all over the house when well, they walked in. So he was thought that, um, but the uh, investigators ended up like disputing that saying the handwriting isn't close enough. It's not his handwriting. And, um, and also he, they were saying like the picture is not Elizabeth Short. So you're just making things up. That's not. That's Siegel and all the way there. Huh? That's Siegel and then it's up all the way there. Yes. Or no, no, no. That's, um, let me do it. Oh, okay. Yeah. The public response, there wasn't a whole lot of response other than people were really freaked out and starting rumors, but there was a lot of like movies and books. Um, the most popular was The Doll the Black Dahlia, it was a movie by James Elroy. Um, and then Severed the True Story of Black Dahlia, which is Joan Gilmore. Um, and there were a few other books about her, um, but those are the most notable. Uh, Black Dahlia Red Rose by Pugh Emily, I think was her name, or Emily Pugh. And then, um, yeah, that's about it. And then The Black Dahlia Falls, Files, as I talked about with um, the last slide. Okay, and then, so there were a lot of myths and rumors about it, like I said, with the public response. One was that uh, the torso murders were connected, but that was an entirely different crime, although there were a lot of, there was a serial killer. Then the torso murders all across, like the West Coast, mostly uh, California, but really, if you look at like the um, bodies and the victims and everything, like the Black Valley, there were a lot of key differences, and the Black Valley was way more, like severely mutilated and was a lot more gruesome. Um, and this, um, the, the initials L and D were part of her back, which is not true, but people spread that rumor because they wanted Leslie Dillon to be uh, guilty so bad that they just continued to um, like force that. Um, and yeah, and then there was another George Knowlton. Um, people claimed that she was, he was, she was killed by him, but he was never actually a suspect. They were saying that he had killed her um, because he had gotten her pregnant, but that was also not true. There was no evidence of pregnancy. And then also prostitution was claimed, but she was actually not a prostitute. She was, uh, a lot of that stemmed from she was always in bars, but really people like always said she was never, um, she never went home with any men or anything like that. And she was completely broke. So we're not really going to do that. She did not have any money that she could go to. Oh, and the name Origin. So it comes from the movie, or the movie, uh, The Blue Dahlia, which was like a mystery, well, not really a novel, but it was it comes from that. And Iggy Underwood um, coined that term and um, changed it slightly because she had like striking black hair and clothes. Um, and it just caught on and people started using it, obviously. And then my personal I if I had to pick, I'd say George Holbrook because I think that um, makes the most sense out of all the suspects I found. But there's also a lot of uncertainty in it. I mean, it was a little cold case for a reason, but I don't know. Yeah. You don't like his mustache, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any questions? Yeah, that's one I've all I've seen a couple of things and read a couple of things. So I'll see if I can get a chance. Get a chance. And yeah. yeah, you can show up a lot with the facts. Yeah. And there's my size. So yeah. Good job. Well done. All right. Alvin. You gotta do now your version of the last black. Malaysia. The true killer. Good job. Don't blame. 
Give me one sec. All right. All right. It's what happened to the flight MH370. I'm sure everyone here knows about the flight it happened in 2014. I didn't even know that was a video, actually. Oh. This live footage. Well, it's not a plot, that He didn't even know what happened. Oh, this live footage from the flight. I don't even think this is like the same ocean, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. Maybe that's a part of the mystery. Hmm. All right. The facts of the mystery. It happened on uh, March 8, 2014. It was a flight from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing. And it carried 227 passengers and 12 crew members, and it was a Boeing 777. And then you can see this flight path a little bit. I'll go over that. And then so the disappearance, the transponder and the aircraft communications addressing and reporting system, or the ACARS, um, they both went off. And they basically, when both of these went off, the only way that they could track the plane was through sonar. And these things are not supposed to turn off. And it was last tracked near Vietnam. And then the black box, which is not the official term, but it's a flight recorder. And it shows, it basically shows what was happening on the plane. And that was never recovered. And you can see the flight. So the red dash line is the intended flight plan. So it's from Kuala Lumpur up to Beijing. And it suddenly took, this suddenly went west, and it was last spotted here from the uh, military radar. And then the search began, and uh, so the search covered more than 64,000 square miles of the Indian Ocean floor, but they failed to find it, and it was a, a huge global effort. And then now the search is continued by a company called Oceans Infinity. And they actually recently released a thing saying that they vowed to find a plane. And the search lasted for three years, so up until 2017. And then there's here's a picture of a piece of the plane that was confirmed to be a part of Flight 370. And then because of all of like the lack of information, a lot of conspiracies came up. So one of them was that there were no phone calls made. And if you like probably know like 9-11 and like other flight like like uh, plane crashes, usually like the people that are on board or that are able to make calls will attempt to or at least try to leave messages. And then this other one was that there's little radar information for like the plane because they only tracked it like slightly off the coast of Vietnam. But that could be chalked up to com uh, countries not wanting to reveal the capabilities of their sonar and radar. And then this one was really weird. Allegedly, the last message that the pilot said was good night, Malaysian 370. But the plane left in the morning. So that was kind of odd. And then back to the Boeing, the significance of it being a 777 was that Malaysia Airlines found a 15-inch crack in the fuselage of one of its planes. And it was days before the Flight 370 disappeared. And it was one of the few 777s that weren't stopped from taking off because of the error. And then more Let's of that. Let's one thing real quick. Yeah. The, uh, good night. Yeah. I, I know what that means. That means they're leaving the they're leaving radar. Oh, OK. So they just say good. That just the pilot said it. He wasn't fly that much. I just have to. OK. And then continued, and then here's a mural of the flight. The Federal Aviation Administration insists that it issued a final warning two days before the disappearance. So the plane should not like have ever taken off because of the crack in the fuselage that was found in the other 777, so they wanted to like investigate all of them. But the Daily Mirror claimed that the missing jet did not have the same antenna as the rest of the 777, so it didn't receive the warning. It did not take off, but... And then, like, I didn't put any conspiracies that like the plane landed somewhere or that it was taken because, like, it's clear like the plane like definitely crashed. And you can see the confirmed pieces, and then the the likely pieces, but the green parts are for sure pieces that were found 
on like the coast of Madagascar and other African countries. And then there's some fun quotes. Uh, <laughs> for some reason, the media will not print anything that involves Boeing or the CIA. And Putin spoofed the plane's navigation data so that he could fly unnoticed into Baikonur Cosmodrome so that he could hurt the West. And that was from U.S. science writer Jeff Wise. And here is a picture of uh, Mahathir Muhammad. And he is actually was a uh, Malaysian leader at the time. And then the opinion that matters, mine. <laughs> Ma Malaysia flight 370 was just a tragic accident, either from human error or yeah, just from human error or uh, an explosion in flight. It is not a massive conspiracy. And then I don't know why I put this, but it's like possibilities of what could have happened. So possible sudden oxygen loss. And then back to the batteries. Um, I was carrying like a bunch of lithium ion batteries in the cargo and I could have lit in fire. Human error, like the pilot could have gotten lost, could have been too tired, anything like that, or a hijacking. That's all I have. Yes. So the crash in the fuselage was did this flight also have one of those or they like they don't know if it did, but they didn't want it to look at all okay. the bones so of the seven. Well, yeah. That yeah. And the batteries and oxygen loss. Yeah, could be. Obviously, Russians are aliens, right? Everyone with me? Yeah. The Elohim. Very good. The most. Dangerous. But yeah, it's such an amazing story. All right, good job. Yeah, I'm leaning towards the lithium batteries too. The fire those put out would be a pea suit fire. I mean, you literally can't see anything. You can't open up a plane at thirty thousand feet and let it out. <laughs> I guess you can, <laughs> but yeah, good story though. Hey, no, I'm gonna come back. Or it could have been like the boys where some superhero lasers the plane and then it falls in half and then explodes. That's all. It was that scene was insane. Dude, that whole show was just mad. The good show. Uh, I just one stack of the case because. <laughs> Why isn't this working? Honestly, at that point, it like bridges on that. Dude. Something like some of the satire in that show is like spot on. Well, we need another disappearance. Jimmy Hobbs, I'm not going If he disappears, that counts he's right there. That's the uh, recipe. That's Johnny Hoffa. That's what he's ah. All right. So mine is the mysterious disappearance of Jimmy Hoffa. So first things first, who was he? Um, he was born on February 14th, 1913. He was a union uh, leader, pre leader president. That's right. That's his official title uh, for the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. And on his way to the top, he became involved with the mafia. Um, and in 1967, he was arrested for jury tampering, bribery, uh, conspiracy, and then just various types of fraud, stealing from union funds, all that good stuff. And he was supposed to be in there for 13 years, I think, and, but he was out in 1971 from a pardon. On the, the only uh, term for that, he couldn't be part of like union activity until 1984. So his last appearance was on July 30th, 1975. He had a planning meeting with these two guys named Anthony Provenzano and Anthony Giacomo. I don't know how to say it, but um, they were mafia rivals. They didn't want him to uh, be the president of the union again after he got out of prison. So they had planned a peace meeting with him at the Red Fox restaurant at 2 p.m. And so Jimmy Hoffa, he was on his way to the restaurant and he stopped by his friend into his house, just talked about whatever. Uh, Hoffa continued on to the restaurant, but then around 2.45, he called him again and said, hey, I've been stood up, they're not here. They're supposed to be here 45 minutes ago. And then after that, a few witnesses saw him get into a car with some strangers. We don't know exactly who yet. Um, and then after that, he just never returned home. Came back. 
so the immediate investigation after one of the first pieces of evidence was his scent was discovered in the mercury marcus room uh, and that was in august august 21st of the next week. and that car was actually owned by Jacqueline's son and it was borrowed by the guy named charles l Ryan, who was um pretty much jimmy's foster son and later in life they had like grown apart and started to hate each other essentially so hmm. suspicious and then on uh, December 4th, 1975, there was a court hearing and an unnamed witness identified three killers, although they're probably not the ones. And those suspects were a guy named Thomas Andretta, another guy named Gabriel Vigilio, but the important one was Salvatore Vigilio. He was like, um, that'd be the driver for Provenzano. They were just like close. However, after this, there was no 100% conclusive evidence, and so no one was charged or included. And in 1976, an FBI report called the Hoffix Memo was made, released, and it just summarized evidence and possible motives. One motive could have been that it was just like a personal thing against Hoffa. Could have been Charles O'Brien, who just didn't like him, from Zano. They could have had something. Another one could have been during his time, during Hoffa's time in prison, he could have been cooperating with the FBI and giving up like mafia names, and they just wanted to get him out of there. <laughs> there have been like mentions of it, of it being an accident, but like not anybody in the FBI says that or believes that. It's just kind of like eh, not not really. Nice. Um, another development came from 2004 book which was written by Charles Brain called by Bridge Creek Houses. And it outlines a mafia confession by this guy named Frank Shearer. And he said that O'Brien from earlier, he drove Julio Papa and himself to a house in Detroit that was um, was owned by this really shady real estate guy who's probably also part of the mafia and that's how they were able to get a house. And then while there, Sheeran Bill Hoffa cremated the body at and a uh, crematorium that was also heavily related to the mafia. And so after this book was released in 2004, uh, the FBI went to that house, investigated it. There were bloodstains there, but they weren't confirmed as Jimmy Hoffa's. So somebody died, but there's another mystery in its own right there. Later claims and developments in the story. 1982, Apple was declared uh, legally dead seven years after his disappearance. And in 2001, they managed to get a piece of Papa's hair out of the uh, car I mentioned earlier. And proof it was his, got his DNA. Um, so it was definitely over. And then pretty much everything past this is just speculation and random people saying, I'm the one who killed Jimmy Hoffa. It was me, guys. Um, no true proof. There was a swimming pool excavated. Somebody said, oh, he's buried under a swimming pool. That one. And then and there was a farm in rural Michigan that the FBI uh, raided. wasn't there. Uh, and then in 2012, there was a driveway in Roseville, Michigan that was searched and not there. And on October 25th, 26th of last year, um, he, somebody said he was buried in a steel drum in the Jersey City landfill, and you guessed it, not there. So, yeah. my thing, I believe he was probably killed and cremated and then just spread around so his remains aren't really. So he's yeah. still alive with DBP. That's right. Yeah. He was DBP. Don't, don't even put DB next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. DB's a good guy. And yeah, so. No. You know why it's harder so, I'm not sure about that, no. I'll tell you one thing real quick. You remember, remember, you remember during the Vietnam War, Nixon was trying to appeal to people who uh, union men, union people were upset at the anti-war movement. So he parked our office and tried to appeal to the people who were <laughs> upset about the anti-war movement. That's purely it. <laughs> just a just ham-handed political move. Did people even like Hopper after all the corruption and stuff? Because wasn't he using like union funds and like oh, yeah. screwing them over? Las Vegas casinos and, and then the 
found by rare book dealer Wilfred Voynich in 1912 at this like book selling thing. Um, it does pop up a few times throughout history, but it's kind of hazy. Like this is extremely mysterious book and it is made out of vellum, which is like calf skin. So that was interesting. So what we know, we know for a fact that it was written in either 15th or 16th century, or yeah, century Europe, maybe Italy, not 100% sure though. Um, the book contains pictures of plants, animals, people, and like astrological and like zodiac symbols and stuff. It's really weird. <laughs> um, it's in a completely unknown language. Possibly with roots with like Latin, Roman, and maybe Arabic. Um, what we don't know, we don't know who wrote it, and we actually really don't know anything at all. Um, all we know is it's kind of popped around the world a little bit. That's about it. In terms of the public reaction, there's been a lot of confusion, rightfully so. Um, a lot of people have been trying to solve it because, you know, the fame and glory of doing that would be great, but um, nobody's going to get. Um, fun fact, during the Cold War, the FBI actually was looking into it because they thought it might be communist pro propaganda. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people also think it might be a hoax and that Wilfred Voynich actually just made it up himself just to get his name out there. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so the theories, there's pretty much just two main ones so far that scholars have shot. The first one was Nicholas Gibbs. He claimed that it was probably a woman's health guide. It was just like written in a really abbreviated Latin. But that one's just kind of bland. I don't know. <laughs> Um, and J David Cheshire um, claimed that it was probably made by Dominican nuns for the Queen of Aragon. This one is also kind of weird. He claimed that the language was like a proto-romance and it was made up of Spanish, Portuguese, French, Italian, Romanian, Catalan, and Galician. So um, a large mixture of things. He said that it was probably like a language very popular in the, in the Mediterranean during medieval times, but it was never really written down because the popular language of the time was Latin. It was used by like royals and Catholics. Um, my personal evaluation could be anybody. I don't know. I don't, I do not think it was a hoax though, just because I really looked at it and that would have taken way too much time. Unless he really, really wanted to do something like that. <laughs> and because there's the little documentations of where it might have been in the world. But and I just wanted to show some of the pages because they're like really weird. 
And that's like the writing. I don't know if you can see it too well, but it's just really. Yeah, you see like some Latin letters, but then again, it's like, yeah. I like the little stars on the side. There's a lot of really weird drawings. I couldn't put some of them in here though, because it was mostly like naked women. <laughs> So that's where the women's health thing comes from. Yeah, yeah. That, that well, would make a little more sense. Yeah. I think in the margins of the books that were written by Scribe, they would put all these amazing drawings. So that was the oh, norm. Should we should bring that back. That's, that's what that's that's so that I mean. Yeah. More, it's, it's, it's wild. And lots of plants and various things. Yeah, but they're really weird plants. Like, it's nothing you'd ever normally see, I think. It's really cool. So, alien. Right? Aliens? Maybe. Yeah, aliens. All right, good job. I like that. That's a good story. Feminine evil king. This is all Doug Taylor. Yes, you're up. Do you remember the, in like the kids' books when there would be little like uh, drawings on the like corner of each page and you'd flip them and they like do that? Bring those back. Give me one sec. Okay, so I had uh, Amelia Earhart. Uh, so she had a pretty just standard childhood. She was born in Kansas, July 24th, 1897, and she later moved to, is it Desmonet? That I can't pronounce that. Um, Des Moines. Des Moines. Des Moines. Des Moines. <laughs> Des Moines, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> Des Moines, Iowa, yeah. Uh, but she was described as uh, basically kind of a tomboy as a kid. Uh, she was an adventurer, her and this little sister, um, just always interested in being outside and playing around. Uh, you would think that given what she became upon seeing her first ever plane, she'd get really excited about it. Um, but she just kind of looked at it and wrote it off as just like a bunch of bolts, just nothing special at all, which... Disappointed her dad because her dad really wanted at least one of his daughters to be an aviator eventually. Um, so he wasn't too happy about that. But uh, pre flying career, she graduated high school uh, out of Chicago and um, went to college at Columbia University, but she dropped out after that. And after that, she became a registered nurse. Um, she, it was about World War I era. So the Spanish flu was something that was going on. It was not a good thing, actually. Um, but being a nurse, she was exposed to Spanish flu and all that. And she actually, actually suffered from maxillary sinusitis and pneumonia. And maxillary sinusitis actually was a pretty big deal for her. It really affected her for the rest of her life. Um, there are stories about sometimes in order for her to fly, she would have to puncture this hole in her cheek and have a tube that would like drain out like mucus uh, in order just to fly, which made for an uh, uncomfortable situation. Uh, and then Frank Hawks, this guy here, he uh, actually took her on her first plane ride and that's when she realized she really likes planes. She was about 200 feet off the ground and she's like, I'm doing this for the rest of my life. I have to. Um, so what put her name on the map was uh, her transatlantic flight in 1928. She joined Wilmer Stoltz and just kind of sat along with the ride and became the first woman to cross the Atlantic. Uh, and then later in 1932, she would actually fly solo across the Atlantic herself um, because the first time she wasn't actually the pilot. Uh, and then her goal as an aviator was to circ circumnavigate the globe. Uh, and she wanted to do so. A lot of people, not a lot of people, but people had done it, but she wanted to have the most direct flight across the equator. So she'd like travel the most distance. Uh, so 1937, she planned to, she planned to do it. Her first, her first one didn't go so well. Um, pretty quickly when they were taking off, uh, one of the wings just hit the ground and that just ruined the plane. So that, threw away her first attempt. But then her second attempt, it went really well. She started in Oakland right here, made it all the way around the world to uh, Lay New Guinea, which is right there. Um, and 
She was planning on flying from Lake New Guinea to Howland Island, which is right about there, with uh, Fred Noonan, who was the navigator in the plane with her at the time. She was normally flying with about two other people. A lot of times her husband, um, George Putnam, would come along, but this time, for the sake of just having as much fuel as possible, uh, she just took her navigator, Fred Noonan. Uh, they didn't make it. Um, the Navy, so they sent out the Itasca to Howland Island to kind of receive um, Amelia Earhart, but there was, they did a really bad job of it. Um, a lot of radio malfunctions between the two. The Itasca, they could hear Amelia Earhart and her transmissions, but they couldn't send transmissions there themselves. Um, it's because a few things were taking off the Earhart's plane in order to fly there, and a few things from the task that were taking off were taken off as well for uh, because they were not functioning. They were put, they were put back on. Um, and that's a ship. That's that's the Navy ship. Yeah, it's a cutter. Uh, so George Noonan, uh, he, in order to uh, fly to the Howland Islands, they couldn't hear anything from the ship, but they also knew that. Helen Island was on the line 157-337. So they just kind of navigated based off of where the sun was and they could only fly along that line, just trying to search back and forth for Helen Island. And the last message received from Earhart was this, Cassie, we must be on you, but cannot see you, but gas is running low, been unable to reach you by radio. We were flying at 1,000 feet. And that's the last thing ever heard from Earhart. Uh, and then nothing. So there are a few theories about what happened. The first one, this one is very popular. It's a, the Gardner Island hypothesis. So the Gardner Island is right here, which is just about in line with the Howland Island. So um, in order for that one to make sense, Earhart and Noonan would fly to this line and they couldn't see Howland Island. So they just went directly south to Gardner Island and then they crash landed there and then they were gone. We are looking, we've looked around Gardner Island, haven't found anything there. So that doesn't seem super likely. Uh, and then these are in order from most likely to least likely. The second is Japanese capture theory. For this one, um, what they would have had to do is get in this line and then they would have to book it north towards about Saipan or this atoll right here, uh, those are both in Japanese Japanese waters, and from there they would either be shot down or crash landed and captured by Japanese, and then they would were to be executed. There are stories about seeing pictures of Amelia Earhart and George Noonan on Japanese islands, but those turned out to just come from magazines that came out four years ago. Um, and then there's also a theory that Amelia Earhart was an FDR, was a spy for FDR, and she was actually um, spying on the Japanese. And uh, the reason she was killed is because the Japanese found her and executed her. What probably happened was the crash and sink theory, um, and it's pretty anticlimactic. She was just flying around near Hall Howland Island, ran out of fuel, crashed in the ocean and sunk. Um, and there's not much to that. And obviously her name has carried a lot because of the significance of her achievement and what she meant for women in aviation. And that's where all this craze has been about trying to find and explain Amelia Earhart. That's where all these different theories come from. Bitch probably ran out of fuel and crashed in the ocean. Oh, and I will say this. Uh, there recently I've noticed that there's been like ideas that they've actually found the plane in the ocean. It they haven't found it yet. They've just they've been looking around a lot, but it still hasn't been found. Good job, Jeff. That's really cool. Good. Hey. We need Bigfoot, right? We need... Someone say Smallfoot. I can go quick. Give me a minute. 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 Give
Go. All right. Bigfoot 101. So, Bigfoot really became popular in 1958 because a story was published from California. These loggers found giant footprints, didn't know what they were, things like that. They kind of put it in as like a funny story. Nobody was going to believe it. Readers loved it. And it's still around today. But Bigfoot wasn't around just in 1958. He's been around for centuries. So what exactly could a Bigfoot be? Everybody thinks tall, hairy, bulky, you know, just creature in the woods, hikes all day. That's what everybody most time thinks, and that's probably what he could be. How about they draw him? <laughs> so this is actually a videotape. I won't play it because we only got a couple minutes, but this is the first video evidence that really made Bigfoot popular. And one thing about this video that was later explained to me is at the time this was taken, CGI was not big. And actual like suits, costumes, things like that, they weren't the best. They looked fake, they looked cheap. In this video, if you freeze frame it, they have a whole bunch of new ones that have been looked into. You can see his muscles moving under the suit, which can only really be done with CGI or really, really well, like, if you put the fur in one by one into a mesh costume. So I was definitely not around for that. Another thing is his feet in the video. They are not like ours. Ours have the arch and everything, but his is broken in the middle and it arches and closes in like that to move forward. So it helps give him better traction on the rocks, everything like that. Um, that was actually explained very well by Professor Jeff Meldrum in a video that I watched. This is all the Bigfoot sightings right now. Washington has the most with over 600, but they also think that is partly because of the population. So how did public react? Everybody kind of thought he was a joke, you know, but um, so he was just this character in novels, books, magazines. He was just kind of like thrown around. He actually ended up becoming a sexual predator in some movies, which is kind of alarming. But uh, he also became known as an environmental icon, especially for the woods, you know, to take care of it, keep Sasquatch happy. Yep, that movie is absolutely amazing. So currently, there's actually some really cool sites available. The BFRO is one of them. They're still up and running. They have sites, I think it was about 10, 12 days ago that they have posted about. Another really cool one is the Sasquatch Chronicles, where they tell stories of people who have actually seen Bigfoot. And a lot of people think, oh, you spot Bigfoot, you're a redneck, you're making stuff up. No, these are judges. These are professors. These are actual like police officers. These are actual credible witnesses that say they have actually seen Bigfoot. But Bigfoot's just not really popular today. He's kind of dying out. So my personal evaluation, I definitely believe there's something out there because not even just with Bigfoot, there is definitely something out there because of personal experience and everything else. But there's something out there. There is no way that all around the globe, the exact same footprint with the exact same break in the middle could just be universally well known when times nobody communicated around the world. And that is my presentation on Bigfoot. I don't think there's a the video clip. Sure. Who's Big Feet? Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm not going to move it so that now it's going to get open the sash button. All right, here we go. Here's the clip. Oh. In the enhanced video, they actually have, they stopped it by milliseconds and then put it all together. Like they had actual photo analysts down at colleges, things like that. Um, they studied it. If that's the, they use computer enhancement to focus. This is old, this is eight millimeter film. Mm -hmm. This is a free video. Right? The video had just been invented. Yeah. 
67. I remember that. All right, good job. <laughs> yep, I can remember that. No, we're not going to watch the film that made big for the star. Did you think it's there? And <laughs> They had to pay six months for the camera and actually take out a loan just to get the camera. <laughs> <laughs> they spent all their money on this. No, because it's really their bank records. How much would a Bigfoot be worth? I'd say at least like a million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> so, there'll be a few questions on that. We will finish up picking our myths tomorrow. Or do you want to do it right now? Who's going to be here tomorrow? We're going to be here tomorrow. So we'll do it tomorrow. We'll quick pick the rest of your myths. Tech, we'll start over again. I'm kidding. Can you pick a myth? Yes. I'm going to do a couple. I'll do the same thing. I'll pick some. I have a couple that no one's going to do. And then I'll do, I'll, I'll pick a few that no one did. I like doing that. That's good. That was fun with mystery. Good. A few. Kind of clips. Talk a little bit about it. Which ones did you do? I like those. Some of the vintage class years that I've been all of you were some of the more two minutes. Who's the body part to the iPad? Sasquatch. Oh, only for members. Yeah. We should look up uh, James Grant. What do you guys, who do you think? Um, yeah. You think like the bomb just go there and.